Welcome to Hot Chips 30. Session 7. Machine Learning 1. Welcome back from lunch to the first of two sessions on machine learning. In this first session, we have three presentations on design spanning from the data center to the edge. Uh, the first presentation is from ARM on their first generation machine learning processor. Ian Brad, a distinguished engineer at ARM, will be presenting. Ian leads the machine learning technology group at ARM before working in machine learning, Ian was an architect on several, several generation of ARM GPUs. Prior to ARM, Ian worked at the multi-core startup Tylera. He's worked on CPUs, GPUs, memory systems, and SOC architecture, and has over 23 granted patents. Let's welcome Ian to the stage. All right, um, thanks everyone for giving me the opportunity to come here to uh, Hot Chips and present. I think this is a really uh, special conference and special community, and I, I always uh, enjoy my time here. Um, so before I get started, I'd, I'd just like to say that while my name is are, are on the slides here, this is really the combined effort of a very large team. ARM has a machine learning business unit of uh, over 150 people, and, and we're growing quite quickly. And most of those people have contributed in uh, some way or another, either hardware or software, uh, to this design. Um, so they've, they've really done a great job. Uh, OK, and just to, just to kind of set the stage here, so I'm going to talk about our first generation uh, machine learning processor, and particularly kind of focus on the architecture. Um, the problem that we're trying to solve here is that ARM works with uh, partners across a, a huge range of different segments. And what we've seen over the last couple of years uh, is that pretty much without fail, all of those partners are reaching out to us and saying, um, you know, we'd like, to, we'd like to accelerate machine learning in our platforms. So we're really seeing it show up kind of everywhere. Uh, so the challenge uh, f for you know, my team as architects was to try to come up with the, the fundamental technologies and the fundamental architecture uh, for a machine learning processor that could be used uh, for multiple different segments across kind of multiple different verticals. OK, so ARM's uh, machine learning processor, and by the way, I, I say machine learning here, but what, what I really mean is neural networks. So it's, it's really focused for neural networks. Um, it's, a, it's an optimized design that was basically built from the ground up uh, for machine learning workloads. Uh, we had a few missteps within ARM actually early on where you know, anytime you come to a new problem, you, you bring the framework uh, from your old problem to that new problem. And, and the result of that was that you know, the CPU guys looking at machine learning said, oh yeah, no, I know how to solve this with CPUs. Um, and the GPU guys looking at machine learning were saying, oh yeah, I know how to solve this with GPUs. And actually, the more we dug into it and the more we investigated, we realized that this is, this is actually a new type of processor. Uh, and it actually leverages kind of key uh, technical uh, innovations from both the CPU space around like uh, control and programmability, as well as from the GPU space around like compression, data movement, and uh, arithmetic density. So this is a, you know, a ground up design really targeted for machine learning. Um, you know, because it's a ground up design, you'd expect it to have a massive efficiency uplift compared to CPUs and GPUs, and it does. Uh, we have an open source software stack which enables uh, easy deployment. <coughs> and uh, like I mentioned before, we've really tried to architect this design with uh, the fundamental components to allow us to, to address an, uh, an array of different markets. 
Um, so the first design, the first specific configuration of this design, which I'm going to talk about today, uh, targets the, the mobile market with derivatives coming on for, for additional markets. Okay, so here's a high-level block diagram of the ML processor. Uh, kind of the fundamental building block of the processor is uh, what we call a compute engine. Within each compute engine, uh, the main components are a slice of SRAM. In this case, for this configuration, it's a 64 kilobyte slice. Uh, there's a Mac engine, uh, which is where convolutions are performed. Um, and then there's something called the programmable layer engine. Um, and I'll talk about all three of those things uh, in more depth. So there's 16 of these compute engines. Uh, there is a DMA engine for uh, talking to the external memory interface. And the DMA engine also you know, knows about different ML layouts, and it does some kind of swizzling and handles strides and other, other kind of complicated things. Um, and we've also leveraged uh, ARM CPU technology for our control unit here, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. So kind of the, the high-level metrics here is you know, 16 uh, of these compute engines in this first configuration. Uh, if you add up the total kind of Mac engine throughput, that's four tera ops uh, per second at one gigahertz. You know, the targets here is basically we're looking at greater than three tera ops per watt uh, in seven nanometer and, and roughly two and a half square millimeters in seven nanometer. The design is targeted towards eight bit uh, quantized integer. So we support like the asymmetric style uh, quantized integer that you see in NNAPI. Uh, we also support 16-bit uh, values, and this is really for use cases where you have pixels coming in or pixels coming out that are larger than 8-bit, um, although the 16-bit performance is uh, 4x uh, slower than the 8-bit performance. Uh, we have one megabyte of SRAM. Uh, from an uh, API perspective, we support ARMNN API. So ARMNN API is an ARM uh, inference API. We also support uh, the Android NN API, which is a, an inference API that, uh, that Google has created for Android. The design is optimized for convolutional neural networks, although we do support neural networks with state like recurrent neural networks. Um, and the IP will be released to partners the uh, latter half of this year. OK, so, so when creating this talk, we tried to kind of distill the architecture down to the the four components or four ingredients that we think are maybe the most unique to a machine learning pro processor. So what are the four things you really kind of have to get right uh, for a machine learning processor? Um, and here they are. There's you know, something uh, called static scheduling, uh, efficient convolutions or efficient dot products. Uh, you need bandwidth reduction mechanisms. And you need some flavor or some type of programmability and flexibility. Um, you know, it's the Wild West out there in terms of neural networks, and things are changing very quickly. So you need some amount of future proofing. OK, I'll talk a little bit about static scheduling. Uh, you know, an interesting um, artifact of neural networks, in particular like neural network inference, the uh, memory access patterns are all perfectly statically an analyzable and kind of understood and can be understood a priori at compile time. Um, and this is really something that, that you need to take advantage of in an ML processor. Um, so CPUs have these uh, you know, extremely complicated cache hierarchies, and these are really designed around optimizing for non-deterministic memory accesses. But for neural networks, it's all kind of deterministic. You can lay out everything in memory ahead of time. Um, and and uh, our design takes advantage of that. So the basic flow is that uh, you know, we have a compiler that takes uh, a neural network, um, and it creates a command stream. And this is a, a trivialized command stream, but the basic idea here is that these are commands for different components in the machine learning uh, processor. So you might say DMA a block in, uh, DMA another block in, perform some convolution or some other operator, uh, you know, wait until it's done, send the results to SRAM, DMA the, the data back out. It's a trivialized example, but but that's enough to kind of get the picture. Um, and the way this works is that uh, I mentioned we've leveraged ARM CPU technology up here for our control unit. That's actually parsing this command stream, and then it's basically banging registers to control these different uh, components in the design. 
So you know, some implications here on the hardware is that uh, there are no, no caches, obviously. So this might kind of seem obvious now, but you know, two years ago, uh, we were pro had some internal proposals around having caches in neural network accelerators, and we really decided you don't, you don't need them. Um, the flow control kind of between the different components in the machine learning processor is a bit simplified because you're kind of spreading the flow control complexity uh, between the, the hardware and this control unit in software. And that software gives you lots of flexibility in terms of dependencies and, and ordering of different uh, things that you, want, you, know, you may want to use the processor for. Uh, and you also have uh, relatively predictable performance. So this, this whole design takes very um, kind of careful co-design of the machine learning with the compiler. And I think if you, know, if you had to, to describe kind of the architecture of the processor with a capital A, it's kind of whatever the compiler needs to, to generate this uh, command stream. Um, so for example, it needs to know the size of that SRAM. That's kind of an architectural uh, thing now. Uh, so that it can properly allocate different regions of the SRAM as you're, op uh, as you're processing different neural network layers. Okay, so now we'll talk about kind of the second key ingredient. This is uh, efficient convolutions. Um, so if, if you look at uh, uh, kind of this, the churn in neural network architecture over the last few years from AlexNet to in, until today, uh, there's been quite um, a lot of innovation in terms of the different types of uh, uh, network architectures, the different types of operators, and things have really been changing a lot. But the underlying requirement of just kind of high throughput, high performance, energy efficient dot products um, is pretty constant through all that. So that's actually something that's, that's worth optimizing for. Um, so the way convolutions are, are mapped onto this design um, so I've shown uh, the SRAM here. The, the compiler will allocate a portion of the SRAM for input feature maps, so that's your input activations. Uh, we also store the, the model weights uh, for the neural network uh, compressed in SRAM as well. Um, and we store the output feature maps, so the output activations uh, for a layer in SRAM as well. And each compute engine will be working on a different output feature map, uh, and this is interleaved across the compute engines. So uh, for example, compute engine one uh, would be working on output feature map one, compute engine two could be working on output feature map two, um, et cetera. Uh, the input feature maps are kind of interleaved across all of these internal SRAMs. So diving into the Mac engine a little bit more, each Mac engine is capable of eight 16 wide dot products per cycle. And what I mean here by 16 wide, I mean is it, it takes a, a 16 wide vector, uh, essentially, where each element is, uh, is eight bits, and it performs a dot product with another 16 uh, wide vector, uh, and sums up the results into a, an existing 32-bit accumulator. So if you uh, add up kind of the compute here and count an FMA or a MAC as two ops, uh, you basically get 256 ops per cycle per MAC engine uh, with 16 MAC engines, because there's one c per compute engine that gives you, uh, you know, 4,000 ops per cycle, uh, so roughly four tera ops at, at one gigahertz. Um, the utilization of that MAC engine is, is dependent on the convolution parameters. So if it's a fully connected layer with batch of one versus, uh, uh, you know, a larger seven by seven convolution, um, that's kind of a function of the, of the convolution itself. Uh, additionally, there's been a lot of, um, I think it, you know, a lot of publications and talk about the fact that some of the uh, non-linearity operators introduce uh, zeros into the activation streams, and you can commonly have like 50% of your activations are zero. So we take advantage of that in our Mac engine by uh, detecting zeros and keeping the inputs to the data path stable uh, so that you don't spend any energy. Okay, so diving into it a little bit more, uh, this is one of the compute engines, and now I'm kind of zooming in on the Mac engine. Uh, so, like I said, each Mac engine can do eight 16-wide uh, dot products uh, per cycle. Uh, there's a set of accumulators down here. Uh, and then we also have something called the, the broadcast network. And basically, the way this broadcast network uh, works is that each compute engine will read a, 
a 2D patch from an input feature, feature map uh, and send that to the broadcast network. In the broadcast network, you then create essentially a, a tensor, so a 3D block of input activations, which is then broadcast to all of the Mac engines in the design. So they're all working on that same block of uh, input activations. Um, I mentioned before that each compute engine is working on a different output feature map, uh, and the, the weights for that output feature map are stored in the local SRAM close to that um, compute engine. So the weights are read, compressed from the SRAM, they're decompressed, and then sent to the Mac engine for, uh, for computation. Now finally, when you've computed the final results for some uh, portion of an output feature map, you've got 32-bit values, uh, you then scale those back down to 8-bit and send them to uh, something called the programmable layer engine. Uh, additionally, ARM is providing a POP package for our Mac engine, um, tuned for 16 nanometer and 7 nanometer implementations. Uh, this will provide a 40% uh, area reduction and a 10 to 20% uh, power improvement. So the Mac engine is very regular and it, it can benefit quite a bit from um, uh, custom physical design. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the uh, kind of the third key ingredient for uh, our machine learning and processor, processor bandwidth reduction mechanisms. So here we kind of leverage some of our GPU expertise uh, in terms of compression technologies uh, and minimizing uh, bandwidth movement. Okay, this is a very simple high-level slide from a simple power model um, that's basically showing that, you know, assume you had a machine learning processor that didn't compress uh, the memory bandwidth, that didn't compress the weights, and it didn't compress uh, the activations. Um, and this is for a hypothetical kind of mobile system with LP DDR4. This, the yellow portion of this pie is basically the power spent uh, in the ML processor, and the blue portion is the power spent uh, reading weights and then reading and writing uh, activations. So the key takeaway here is that you know, the power in the DRAM uh, could be nearly as high as the power in the ML processor itself. Um, so spending dedicated silicon and complexity on uh, compression and minimizing bandwidth is, is absolutely essential because uh, one, you're attacking a, a pretty big piece of a, of a top level power pie um, and you're also you know, just going to be a better uh, citizen in the SOC and use less bandwidth. So it's very important to, uh, to optimize for bandwidth. So in our hardware, we support uh, weight compression, uh, activation compression, and we also support tiling via kind of that, uh, uh, the compiler and static scheduling that I talked about earlier. Okay, this graph is a bit of an eyesore, but the, the basic um, point here is that these are, this is looking, this is a histogram of uh, values in eight by eight uh, blocks of activations for uh, Inception V3, I believe. And the, the x-axis is the number of zeros in the block, uh, and the z-axis is the number of unique non-zeros. So this point right here is basically a block that's, uh, that's all zero. And what you see is that there are a lot of, many, many blocks in the activation stream are, are predominantly zero. So that's an easy one uh, to, to optimize for. So our compression technology uh, we'll optimize for zeros and, and, and compress those away. Uh, I should mention this is lossless uh, compression. Uh, additionally, what we see is that it, if there are uh, non-zero values, you tend to see the same non-zero values repeated. So you want to take advantage of that um, as well. Uh, and our, our uh, compression technology does. So for Inception v3, we see about a 3.3x um, compression ratio for the activations per eight by eight block. I think if you were just going after zeros, it would be like two X, because you know, roughly half of the values are zero or something like that. Um, okay, now I'll talk a little bit about model or, or weight compression and pruning. Um, there's been some really fantastic work a few years ago that showed that um, when you're training a neural network model, 
uh, many of the weight values get very, very close to zero. And if you actually just push those values to zero during training, uh, you can still get the same uh, accuracy, but now you've got a sparse model with a, with a bunch of zeros. Uh, when I first heard about this, I thought, well, maybe that just means the models are like overbuilt, and, and uh, you know, we started with too big of a model to begin with. But there's been some recent uh, work over the past couple of years that have actually shown that you need to start with that big model in order to get the best accuracy, to find the right substructure. Uh, and the implication there is that this sparsity property of neural networks actually might be kind of inherent to the way we train uh, neural networks today. So actually optimizing for that kind of sparsity in the model uh, makes sense in, in hardware. So we support uh, a weight compression format where we uh, compress the zeros out. Additionally, there's been some great work that shows how once you've, got, once you've compressed the zeros out, there's also kind of, uh, you can take the remaining non-zeros and cluster them. So snap them to one of, say, 32 unique non-zero values uh, and still get pretty good accuracy. And we're starting to see this show up in the ecosystem and show up in the tooling. Um, so our uh, hardware compression technology supports that as well. Um, uh, so both optimizing for zeros as well as the case if you've clustered to up to 32 uh, unique non-zero values. Our models are compressed offline, so this can be done during the compilation phase. If you train with, with clustering and pruning, uh, uh, then we'll take the model and we'll compress it in our tool chain. And then we keep the model compressed all the way until we uh, basically uh, read out of our internal SRAM and send the results to um, uh, the Mac engine. Uh, and this, this graph here just shows that uh, basically the this is activation bandwidth versus weight bandwidth. So activation bandwidth kind of dominates early uh, in inception before, but uh, weight bandwidth dominates later as you get to like fully connected layers. Um, also, so the compression ratio you get on your model is really highly dependent on the model and the layer. So fully connected layers will, will compress really well. Um, convolution layers also compress well, but, but not quite as much. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, tiling. This is basically uh, tricks that the compiler does to minimize the bandwidth and most effectively use that, that, uh, that SRAM uh, inside the ML processor. I showed on the previous slide that the, the early layers are basically activation uh, uh, memory limited. So in those cases, um, something that our compiler do, can do is it might operate on, for example, the first top of an input layer and then go on to the, uh, the top of the next layer and the next layer. And then you avoid sending those intermediate uh, results between layers to memory and back. Um, so that's tiling. If you're dominated by weights like the later layers um, and you can fit all of your activations in SRAM, uh, our compiler will do things like uh, basically keep all the activations resident uh, in the SRAM from layer to layer and just stream the weights in kind of in a read once fashion. Okay, now I'll talk about kind of the fourth uh, ingredient, programmability and flexibility. So the, the state of the art in neural networks is still evolving. So there's been you know, a huge amount of churn in the neural network architecture space. Um, and uh, there's a lot of innovation around the, in the non-convolution operators. So there's new non-linearities popping up all the time, new, new things people are playing around with. Um, and we really think you need kind of a programmable solution to get some sense of future-proofing around these new layers. Um, so <coughs> we've created something called the Programmable Layer Engine, where we've kind of leveraged our CPU technology uh, to provide an engine for, op for uh, supporting the non-convolution operators. Uh, so zooming into the programmable layer engine uh, a little bit more, what we've done is we've taken some Ar ARM Cortex-M technology uh, and we've actually extended it with uh, neural network and vector instructions targeted just towards the type of behavior we see uh, in non-convolution operators. Um, and so this is where you run things like pooling, ReLU, um, transcendentals, things like that. Um, so the basic flow here is that uh, the Mac engine is uh, generating results. Uh, they come into the vector register file. Uh, 
At some point, the CPU is notified. Uh, the vector engine will process those results. Uh, and then when you're done, those results are DMA'd out to the SRAM. And this is that, that associated uh, chunk of SRAM in, in the compute engine that's sitting next to the programmable layer engine. And, and note that the inputs don't have to be coming from the Mac engine. So this, this engine can write results to the SRAM, read them back to perform an operator, uh, then go back to the SRAM again. Um. Okay, so I, I talked earlier about how you know, the goal is to create an architecture that we think has the right um, uh, components to, uh, to address and scale for multiple different markets. Uh, so I think you've seen uh, you know, enough info about our Mac engine and our compute engines to kind of see that there's multiple different ways to scale this design. So you could scale by you know, increasing or decreasing the number of compute engines. Uh, you can scale by changing the Mac engine throughput. Um, you could also scale by just having more ML processors. So you could like have MP ML processors if you wanted to, if you have multiple different workloads. Um, okay, so in summary, this is our first generation uh, machine learning processor. Uh, Higher order bit here is, you know, four, this is targeted towards mobile, four tera ops of uh, convolution throughput, three tera, or greater than three tera ops per watt um, in seven nanometer and, and roughly two and a half square millimeters. Uh, the focus is really around 8-bit quantized, which is what we see uh, the industry um, having a lot of momentum around for edge inference. Uh, there's one megabyte of SRAM, uh, and we support uh, the Android NN API for inference as well as the ARM NN uh, API for inference, which, which we'll see in uh, embedded Linux platforms. Um, all right, so thanks a lot for uh, having me uh, come and give a talk. Questions? Well, that's all right. Okay. I have a question here. Hello, this is Amit Jindal from Facebook. Quick question on the PLE. Uh, you mentioned that there is a Cortex-M inside the PLE. So if I have 16 compute engines, do I have 16 Cortex-Ms? Yep. Thanks. So you said uh, you have a convolution operator. So do you support 3D convolution? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So do you support 3D convolution? What do you mean by 3D convolution? Uh, let's say if you take a, like a LiDAR input, you have a 3D image, not a 2D. Yeah, you, you could map that down. It wouldn't happen natively, but you could map that down to the hardware. OK. Yeah. Um, can you talk about your uh, feature map compression scheme? How do you do the feature map compression? That's uh, proprietary. I can't talk about that. Sorry. OK. It works really well. <laughs> I have one, one more. This is Gaurav from Facebook. Would like to know what you think about precision lower than 8 bits. So we see a lot of uh, industry momentum around 8-bit right now. We're definitely following uh, lower precision, um, and it's certainly something that we're not dismissing. Um, I think anybody that claims they can predict the future in this space um, is, is probably full of it. So um, yeah, no, I think we're watching this very closely. We've gone with 8-bit now, um, but that could change. Yeah. How soon are you to uh, this RTL being available for licensing? Uh, latter half of this year. Thank you. OK, thank you, Ian. All right, thanks. Our next presentation is on the NVIDIA Deep Learning Accelerator. Fran Sistermans is the presenter. He's a vice president at NVIDIA, and he's responsible for the Multimedia Hardware Architecture and ASIC Design Group at NVIDIA. Let's welcome Franz. Oh, thank you. Um, 
Listening to the previous talk, I thought, well, that could have been my talk, because it's, uh, uh, the, the architectures that we use and the one that ARM uses are actually quite similar. And I'm glad that I don't talk only about architecture, otherwise you guys would be all running out and say, we just heard this. So, um, so the, the NVIDIA Deep Learning Accelerator was originally uh, designed for our Xavier product. Uh, I hope uh, some of you, or most of you actually, got to see the Michael Ditty's presentation yesterday. Um, he talked about our Xavier uh, SOC, which is used uh, in uh, many um, different applications. And uh, deep learning was uh, very important for that field, and we decided to add a more dedicated deep learning engine next to our GPU, uh, specifically for the areas that we already know the, the, the networks for, right? It's, uh, they, they, they use the same kind of uh, operations, layers that, are, that, that we've known for a while, and, and that, that made sense for us to do dedicated engine for that. Um, so we are optimize it for the convolutional neural networks because most of, it, most of our processing is uh, on images and videos. And, um, uh, but we, we do also do other networks. It's, uh, it's not really limited to it, but our tuning is for the convolutional networks. Um, after we did the engine, we, we looked at it and we said, well, the, we really designed this for our Xavier product, which is kind of an edge device, and there's many, many edge devices out there that also could use deep learning, but we cannot build all of them. But overall, we like to encourage the use of deep learning, right? NVIDIA is big in deep learning, so the more people use deep learning, the better it is for us, so we decided to open source our uh, deep learning accelerator for everybody. Um, I must say, when we started that, I thought it would be a lot easier than it, in act it was in actuality. I thought, okay, we, we already have it, right? We just put it on GitHub and we're done, right? That's, of course, far from the truth. Uh, we, we have done a lot of work in um, making it more parameterizable, right? Have different number of, of math units, different sizes of memory, different feature sets. Um, also, we use a lot of very... NVIDIA-specific language in uh, our designs, uh, not standard Verilog, but something that's a little bit different, so we had to change all of that. Um, if you guys go look at the GitHub, you will probably still find some remnants of that, um, so forgive us, and if uh, something that's uh, not completely right, just send us an email and we'll try to uh, fix that. Um, well, CNNs, I think uh, most of the audience will know it by now. I didn't realize there was going to be so many deep learning talks, but uh, you, typically you start with a picture, right? It's a, a cat in my case. Um, you apply a number of different layers, and at the end, the neural network indeed figures out this is a cat, right? And uh, there's convolutional layers and fully connected layers. The convolutional layers are the ones that are most compute intensive, so I'll be talking most about those layers. Um, and here you see one convolutional layer. It, has, it, it starts with a cube of pixels or cube of components, channel feature data, right? That's uh, uh, then filtered by a number of different filters. Each of these filters are smaller cubes. Right, you end up with a new big cube, right, and then you add do the post-processing. Post-processing are uh, things like uh, pooling, uh, of course, the, the nonlinear function, um, some normalization uh, steps. So the architecture basically almost reads like this, and it's, uh, so we have, similar to the ARM, we have the SRAM that has both the input activations and the filter weights. We apply the convolutional core, which is the, the, the big multiply accumulator array, and then we add, do the post-processing. And this is all encapsulated by a control block that sits on the top, and a, a DMA, memory interface, that sits on the bottom. Um, so this is, I think, how you would build any 
CNN accelerator, uh, nothing, nothing special there. Um, Ian also talked about the, the memory consideration, so it's like uh, the problem you have is you have this feature data and you have this, fil this filter data. Both of these could be very big and you need to hold every filter component against every, every feature component, more or less. And so if you cannot fit either of both one of these, you're going to have to reload the memory twice, right, or multiple times. And um, so the, the memory bandwidth starts up adding up very quickly. So you cannot keep everything in your convolutional buffer. Um, now, the convolutional buffer has to be pretty big. I think you cannot really build a good neural network without a big on-chip on RAM. Um, but the convolutional buffer is expensive, so we also have a second level of uh, memory. Um, on my previous slide, no, where is it? Uh, yes, on my previous slide you see an internal RAM and an SDRAM interface. Those are pretty much the same interfaces, but uh, they go to different uh, uh, memories. So the convolutional buffer is expensive. The on-chip SDRAM is a lot more payable, right? And so we, we offer that option. And then the third level, of course, you go to SDRAM, where you have a lot of uh, uh, memory available, but bandwidth and power are uh, problems there. I, I cannot move out of this white line here, the camera. Um, So that's, that's on the memory interface. So if you, if, if you look at the open source core, right, you can decide how much convolutional buffer you want, whether or not you want an internal RAM and how big you want to make that. But you have to think about uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, memory traffic to see how much you will need for your application. Um, here I show an example of the convolutional core. Uh, what we usually do is we, have, we, we work on uh, one input activation and a, a number of different kernels at the same time. So in this uh, case I show one, uh, one input cube with four kernels and of each of the each of them we take 64 activations and 64 weights at the same time for a total of 256 max per clock cycle in this specific example. Uh, now the number of kernels is uh, a variable, the number of uh, pixels you take from uh, the, the input is, uh, is variable, but th that's what, this is one example. Um, the order of calculation, so we typically calculate a whole strip of outputs at a time, um, between 16 and 32 outputs at a time, and we go over that at a weight by weight. So we keep the weights constant for 16 to 32 cycles and we go over the different, uh, different weights. Then after we are we're done, we go further into the weights uh, we, until the whole pixel, the whole output pixel is complete and then we move to the next pixel. Um, some of the area and power considerations that we had. Um, so the more pixels you do at a time, so we do 64 pixels at a time in our case, and in, in, in the example that we had, the, the more pixels you do at the same time, the bigger you can make your Wallace tree, right? It's basically a big multiply accumulator tree, right? And the more samples we do at the same time, the more we can, the, the bigger the tree is, so we can do a lot of half adders instead of full adders, which obviously helps us uh, a lot for uh, area as well as power. On the other hand, if you make the 64 bit, 64 too big and your networks are not, uh, don't have 64 bit aligned number of, cur of uh, channels, then uh, you'll pay for the overhead there. So, so there's a balance there. Um, the reason why we don't calculate one output at a time, but we, we stick to the same weights for a bit, is that uh, the weight data wouldn't change. And again, that, that turned out to be quite a big gain in terms of dynamic power usage. So um, up to like 20, 30% or so of uh, the 
the MAGA ray. So uh, we, so that's why it's why we stick to the same number of weights for a while. Um, yeah, let me go to the next one. So I talked about uh, uh, making things more configurable. So we have different configurations. Uh, the one that we use in uh, uh, Xavier is actually what we call the large configuration. It uh, supports int, int, integer 8 and 16 bits as well as floating point 16 bits. Um, it has two RAM interfaces. It has an integrated controller, so that uh, there's a programmable controller that does all the sequencing uh, within, a, within a network, right? You, so you just send it, hey, go do ResNet 50, and the, the main CPU doesn't get involved anymore until it's uh, completely finished, right? And um, there's weight compression. Um, Ian talked a lot about the weight compression. Uh, we, we don't have as fancy a scheme as uh, ARM, it looks like, for weight compression, but we, we do definitely do weight compression. Um, in the smaller configuration, we uh, do just int8. Int we don't do uh, the 16-bit data types. Uh, we only have a single RAM interface. So as we have no advanced features, so there are some other features that we have that that help that we don't don't use in our smaller configuration. So, on the small configuration, um, here are some of the uh, performance numbers that we get. So, um, for example, uh, let me just go through the first line, and all the other lines work similar. So, in the the first one has a 2K uh, multiply accumulator, so up to 4,096 operations uh, per cycle. Um, the convolutional buffer is 512 kilobyte large. Uh, the area that we get is 3.3 uh, square millimeter. That is pre-layout, so it doesn't uh, include any layout inefficiencies, but it does include all the, the RAMs. That's not always in every IP, but so it's included over here. Um, we're assuming a memory bandwidth of 20 gigabyte per second, which is, of course, quite luxurious, but we, we get those on GPUs. Uh, for that configuration, we measure 269 frames per second of uh, ResNet 50. Um, if you calculate it, I think it's about 50% or so efficiency of the Mac uh, array, so 50% of the Macs are actually doing operations and the other 50% falls off. Um, we're having 388 milliwatts of power for a specific setting, right? You can, you can of course, play with the voltage. Both the performance, I should say, and the power are not the, it's not the highest performance we can get, it's also not the lowest power we can get, but this combination will work. Um, and so that gets us to 5.4 DL tops per watt. And that, so that is for ResNet 50, right? This is not, um, the maximum number of DL tops we could get out of the, the uh, hardware if we were just running nonsense, but this is 5.4 DL tops per watt for ResNet 50. Um, as you can see, it scales pretty well up to 256 max. After that, it, it kind of starts falling off, so you cannot make it too small or you will lose a lot of uh, efficiency, really. Um, I don't know exactly where that's coming from, from which components, but it's, it's basically the overhead. Uh, you need to still keep a pretty big convolutional buffer. Um, all kind of, of, of controllers are still there, right? You can't really get rid of the controller. So, so you, you, you start losing some efficiency after, after you make it too small. Um, here I show one larger conf configuration. Um, so here I, I took the one with 1024 max. Um, if you look at the end 8 performance uh, without uh, internal RAM, right, you see that you, your, your, the performance is still good. It's actually a little bit better than the small configuration because of some of the features that we, uh, we have in the this larger configuration, but the power efficiency went down a little bit. Um, and that's because you, you, of course, also have the hardware there for floating point 16 
and it's not, not completely free. Uh, for floating point operations, we're about a third of the performance of uh, the end eight. Um, if you look at the number of max, it's half, but uh, the memory, memory traffic and stuff like that also uh, starts uh, adding up. So it's about a third, that's what we measure. Um, adding an internal RAM uh, can uh, increase the uh, performance by quite a bit. So we have a, we have a measurement here with two megabyte of uh, internal RAM. And for, for example, the FP16 case, it almost doubles the performance. Uh, obviously, uh, go, going uh, to some different sub subject is uh, the hardware is not everything. You also need the software. Uh, so uh, here I show an example of how the software works. It's, there's a compile time part to it. You take a, a network model, for example, a cafe model. You take uh, the compiler parameters, which is basically telling you what is the hardware have, right? So how many Macs are there? Uh, what features does it support? How big is your convolutional buffer? Um, the, then you compile it and we create what is called a loadable file, which is really the, uh, the, the thing that, that is executable. It, it has all the optimizations in terms of uh, how do you use the Macs, uh, how do you merge the different layers, right? So we, we typically merge convolutional layer with post-processing normalization and, and, and all these layers, right? So this is all combined. Um, so that loadable file is then read by application and uh, it's the loaded by the user model, by the user mode driver into uh, the memory and then the kernel mode driver kicks off all the operations layer by layer. Now this user mode driver could be running on the main CPU, or it could be running on the uh, individual on the on the controller that goes with the DLA. So it's a uh, it's quite flexible in terms of where you run it. Um, there's there's also uh, we've set it up to make it easy to port from one uh, operating system to another operating system. For example, you would use I/O control or so in a, in a Linux, but you would, would just be a function call, for example, in a, in a single process system. Um, so that's just a, a very thin, thin uh, portability layer necessary for, for every application. Um, if we go look at a complete system, right? So uh, obviously you, you, you're not gonna ju have just a DLA IP, so we have set up uh, what we call a virtual platform that allows you to use the uh, DLA in a bigger system. Um, so we have a, a QMU, QMU CPU cluster in that. Uh, in our case, we, we, we've used an ARM processor there uh, that can run all the, the, the OS, the uh, application, and the driver stack. Um, that application then calls the, the NVDLA hardware. The NVDLA hardware could be either using a C model or it could be uh, running on an FPGA, an FPGA board uh, for acceleration. Um, we've made this available on the Amazon uh, cloud. So uh, uh, Xilinx had a talk before saying we have FPGAs in the cloud now, so we are using those FPGAs uh, in the cloud to, to run our NVDLA. Um, and so this, this gives people the opportunity to uh, prototype uh, their system at, at, a, at a bigger level, not just, uh, not just the NVDLA, but, but, a, but a bigger system. Uh, one thing um, that I'm very enthusiastic about myself, uh, since I'm also on the RISC-V uh, board. Uh, we've worked together with Sci-5. Um, Sci-5 is a, a company from San Francisco. They have a table outside here, so go see it. Um, they have what is called Freedom, the Freedom Unleashed platform, which is a kind of an open source 
SOC. Uh, we've connected that, or they, I should say, connected that to an FPGA and deported the DLA onto the FPGA. And so that system uh, is now a complete open source SOC prototype. So for people who, from say academia, you want to do some uh, research on uh, deep learning, you have a real platform available here uh, at, at the RTL level that you could use for this. Um, we've also took the open source YOLO v3 network, uh, it's coming from University of Washington. It's an object recognition uh, network, uh, quite, quite advanced actually, a very nice network. And uh, we, port we ported the 32-bit floating point version that's on the web to 8-bit. And uh, we can run that on uh, this uh, sci-fi platform. Oh, why do I, my video not play? Okay, without video, the video should play, but it doesn't. Um, anyway, that's working. So uh, that, all of that will be available as open source, uh, I believe. And um, so I would say check it out for yourself or you can contribute, it's uh, on the web. The license we have is uh, a permissive license, meaning that you can take it without even telling us and you can do to it whatever you want, you don't have to put it back. But if you want to put something back, we are very interested for people contributing, right? It's uh, not something that we want to keep for ourselves. Ah, there we move, there it moves. Um, it's not something that we necessarily want to uh, keep for ourselves. People can contribute. There's a contributor license agreement as well. Uh, if you contribute, it's the same rules as we give it away with. Everybody can use it for whatever they want. That's, um, that's it. Thank you, Franz. Do we have questions for Franz? Hi, my name is Alex. So uh, from your presentation, I understood that the MVDLA is trying to exploit the parallelism in the channel direction. So mm -hmm. my question is that, how do you guys reinforce the hardware utilization for initial layers of convolutional neural networks? Ah, yes, that's a good question. Yeah, the initial layers have only like uh, typically three uh, channels, right? So that's not uh, very much. Yeah, or for uh, actually like uh, yeah. channel boundaries. Right, so we have some, uh, yeah. So first of all, we do lose some efficiency there. But we uh, we are actually able to get a lot more than this than than the, the the three channels that you have by usually it's followed by pooling so we we are able to trick the hardware and doing a number of pixels at the same time and then to pull at the, at that same layer. Um, it's, gonna, it's going a little bit far to explain it completely right now, but it is in the documentation that's on the website. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ran from Silicon. Um, ah. This architecture is, is great, and thank you for making the open source that yeah. uh, approach. Uh, one thing that we've noticed is the, the, the bandwidth that you have on the output memory is quite high. Yeah. Uh, actually, looking at the numbers, I cannot make sense of why you need so many uh, megabytes there or gigabytes. It's, it's, it, there is nothing in there that is uh, not needed. Uh, so. The one thing you could say is, could we do more um, uh, compression? But other than that, there is, there's, there's nothing that's redundant. So, so um, as I tried to explain, it's like, you know, you, you need to load the weights, you need to load the, the uh, feature data. You can't avoid it, right? So that needs to come in, and there's nothing else there that, that costs bandwidth. If I, the numbers I said are like 20 gigabytes per second. That's basic, for example, right? That's kind of the maximum bandwidth that is available. And you, what you will see is some layers, even at 20 gigabytes per second, are bandwidth limited. Some are at 20 gigabytes per second are, of course, compute limited. Um, there's nothing in the in the network or in our implementation that would ask you to more to use more bandwidth than is necessary by the application itself. And should you consider that bandwidth? For the power calculations and the, and the efficiency? Say it again? The, the bandwidth you have there uh, on the number that you have for the, yeah. for the power, 
Yes. Uh, are you taking care of that? Because that might be no, um, it's, 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 it's uh, the, okay, the, the power numbers I have, yeah, I should have been, been clear in explaining that. It's the IP itself, because it's, uh, this is an IP component, right? If we had talked about Xavier, I would, could have given you the whole SOC, SOC power or performance numbers, but, but since we're talking about IP only, um, that is the, the power number that you see over there. So we, we have a separate rail actually in our uh, chips that is for the CV, we call it the CV rail, computer vision rail, and uh, it's the power on that computer vision rail that we, that we measure. Thank you. Uh, so not the DRAM rail or the, the memory rail, yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Oliver Gunasekra from um, NG Codec. Uh, a couple of questions. One, you know, it's exciting to see the code on uh, on GitHub. Yeah. Uh, but from a customer that would potentially use, um, what's the time difference and uh, implementation differences from the use that you have in your own design? Is, is there typically, say, one year lag, or what? What difference is there between the version that shows up in oh. your own silicon versus the version that gets put on GitHub? <laughs> Uh, well, we were trying not to put a. Uh, we're not saying, oh, we're going to put our old stuff there. Let me first of all say that. So it's it's basically you. As soon as we have it, we put it there. But um, to give you an example, uh, the the uh, Xavier chip was presented by Mike Ditty uh, yesterday. So it's it's not been out there that long, and that's kind of the version that you have over here. And we actually already made some improvements over that version that are already rolled into our open source. But obviously, when we were working on the Xavier as, as a year, we, as a front-end team, we finished it probably a year ago or something like that. So maybe there's a, maybe a year, but we're not really trying to, to create an artificial lag. It's where, where we're trying to push out those things as fast as we can. And, and are there any differences, or is it exactly the same RTL? It's not exactly the same RTL because we, you know, the same RTL would be not usable by anybody else because all our tool flows are kind of NVIDIA specific. But there's no differences in terms of functionality. The, so what is, if you look at the website, there's one. Um, one configuration that's called full NVDLA, and that's functionally exactly the same between Xavier and uh, our open source. Quick question for you, Sue Berkeley. Um, can you talk about the connectivity within the convolution array? And um, different types of convolutions have dramatically different communication requirements or memory requirements. Mm -hmm. The arithmetic intensity can differ from a seven by seven convolution to depthwise oh. convolution by a factor of 50. And have, mm -hmm. can you talk about that interaction? Um, you're talking about how big the filter size is? Uh? Uh, I'm talking about um, how easy is it for me to get data into the uh, convolution array? Can I, do I have to kind of, is it a mesh that I have to kind of shift in? Can I address it directly? And then that of course has impact on say, depth-wise separable convolution, which has uh, much less reuse of weights. As, as, I, uh, as you described it, it sounds like you're using a weight stationary architecture, mm -hmm. which is not so great for depth-wise separable convolution and other things, or one by one. So. Um, or we can take it offline. Let's take it offline. I don't really know exactly what you mean, so let's take it offline. If you, are, are you talking about grouping or uh, channel grouping? Uh, well, the, the strict architecture question, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you can answer, which is just if I want to get data to, to a cell in the mesh, yeah. do I have to shift it in, or, or can I more directly address it? Or? It's more, more like a broadcast uh, mechanism. It's coming from the convolutional array. That's all, it's, it's all kind of baked in into the, the control side of the, uh, the DLA, and it, it basically says if you have a 7x7 seven seven filter, it will just loop through the, the, the different filter coefficients. It keeps the weight stationary for like 16 to 32 cycles, which we found is uh, we get most of the power benefits at that point. So it's not weight stationary in the sense that it's going to be weight stationary forever. Yes. To be honest, we can even make it uh, activation stationary and stream the weights. Uh, I didn't talk about that, but that's also possible. Yeah. So just to give a little sense to my question, if, if you have one by one, you're really only reusing that weight once, right? So 
So that's, that's where... Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. Thank yeah. Okay, thank you, Franz. Our next presentations on the Tachium Cloud Chip for hyperscale workloads, deep ML, general symbolic, and bio AI. It'll be presented by Dr. Radoslav Danilik, co founder and CEO of Tachium. Rado has over 25 years of industry experience and over 120 patents in state of the art processing systems. He's previously founded both Skyera and Sandforce. And at Wave Computing, he architected the core of their deep learning DPU. He's been a GPU architect at NVIDIA, a CPU architect at Nishan Systems in Toshiba, and chief architect of x86 CPUs at Gizmo Technology. Uh, welcome, Rado. Thank you. OK. Uh... Good afternoon. So uh, let's start with this presentation. So um, what we decide to build, uh, we decide to build a piece of semiconductor which can be used in uh, multiple areas. Uh, you know, we call that universal processor. Why we call that universal processor? Because we try to unify best of CPU, which is easy programming model, with performance per dollar and performance per watt of GPUs, which are very, very hard to program, and uh, TPUs, which have very good AI performance. Uh, now, the reason, another reason why we call universal processor is because the AI space is branching to multiple areas. You know, we talk about convolutional networks for uh, deep learning, However, the space is much wider these days. Uh, in addition, there is, for example, explainable AI or symbolic AI, which is used by US government in military application. Uh, there is uh, bio AI, which is based on human brain project, uh, which is uh, European Union pushing forward. Uh, and they are, you know, general AI, which is based on concept of uh, actors and so on. So the space become much wider. In addition, uh, there is another branch of AI which is working on uh, basically spiking model and uh, they require different hardware. Generally, GPUs and TPUs are good for convolutional AI but tends to be very bad performance for general AI, symbolic AI, and other disciplines of AI. So uh, we came with the solution which outperforms any solution in this wide range of the applications. Very briefly, uh, you know, our chip is in uh, physical design and we expect to uh, tape out uh, next year. As the startup, we have only one uh, piece, one piece of semiconductor, one die. However, uh, because it's universal platform, uh, we provide uh, three different versions of same die. One which has all the processors enabled, all eight DRAM controllers, all PCIe solutions, which is for general hyperscale applications. Then our customer requires a lower cost, uh, lower density solution, which basically should replace Xeon D in many applications like Facebook web server and so on. And the final version of same die with attached HBM3 mem memory is for high performance computing uh, and AI space. So from single piece of silicon, uh, we are targeting three different segments and provide three different solutions. Uh, to to little bit tell a little bit more about the chip it, it's, uh, it, itself, uh, it has eight DRAM controllers, 64 processing cores, which they have uh, vector processors, and uh, they provide both integer and floating point single threaded performance on specking SPEGFP faster than fast Xeon, or on AI, on floating point, they provide uh, more than two teraflops of performance per single core. 
So having 64 code together, we end up about with 128 teraflops, which is more than NVIDIA Volta is able to provide. Uh, from technology point of view, uh, it's seven nanometer chip uh, in 66 millimeter package and contains 32 megabyte of the memory to reduce the memory bandwidth and, and utilization. Uh, what, is very un very, what is very unique and needed is it provides very high bandwidth communication in the form of two 400 gigabit Ethernet channel. So if uh, a large scale network needs to be constructed, for example, uh, some of our customers are considering using that chip for simulating full capacity human brain in real time, and they require more than 250,000 chips connected. It requires large-scale switching and very large bandwidth uh, to be able to meet the application requirement needs. On the speed, uh, we are reaching, uh, we are exceeding 4 gigahertz performance using standard cells, standard memories, and uh, we don't do any custom design. However, we, we use kind of a, a hand layout with scripts to do structure layout to achieve the speed. And on the area size is about its sub 300 square millimeter chip, which tells that it's very high efficiency compared to like Volta, which is at 800 square millimeter. However, it's on different process. Now, uh, to summarize conceptually what the machine is, uh, it's programmable, uh, you know, we have compiler infrastructure, C, C++, Fortran, Java, uh, we are working on TensorFlow and other applications. So the programming model is more like CPU. It doesn't require CUDA-style programming, which is very labor-intensive, very difficult, yet it allows to achieve similar performance. Now, to compare it on standard task, which servers do in the data centers, hyperscale servers they doing in data centers, the number of the work per clock on server workload is about 1.72 instruction equivalent per clock, which is slightly more than, uh, than Intel Skylake. Together with 4 gigahertz is offering very high single-threaded performance. Now, what is very unique uh, to achieve small die size and very high performance and low power, you know, it was mentioned that out of order execution and dynamic scheduling is, you know, very power intensive, it's area intensive, it dominates the die size of and, and power of the processors. We took new approach. We took and moved the dynamic scheduling out of order execution, we mostly moved to the software layer and uh, we left very, very simple hardware which allows to slide the instruction. So, uh, very considerable innovation is removing expensive hardware, power-hungry hardware, and moving into the software to compiler technology. That removes the, basically what is the downside of the processor, that the cost of fetching instruction is so significant that people start using other uh, platforms like GPUs, FPGA, and so on. Now, despite this dramatic reduction in power and area, uh, the, we, uh, we have been able to achieve performance very similar to out-order execution processors. What we can see as comparison of conventional statically scheduled uh, processor uh, like older Itanium, where we basically can see that more than 50% of the times machine is stalled because of dynamic conditions from caches and other dynamic conditions, while typical out-order execution machine stalls about 15% of the time. So the fact that we achieved on a full-fledged full simulator, which simulates memory latency, caches, and everything, all the stalls, we achieve less than 20% stalling is confirming claim that we can do the out of order execution in software and, you know, uh, speculation and so on, do in software without expensive hardware as register rename, checkpointing, you know, queuing, and so on and so on. So that's the fundamental innovation which changed the performance per dollar and per watt uh, equation. So now, how do people can use conceptually this new class of the silicon? 
So as with new platform, you know, software is always concerned and software can determine winning or losing in the war of the platforms. So we decided and making sure that technology is easy to consume, is easy to use, as easy as possible. What I mean is that, that, that our customers, hyperscale customers, service providers, uh, high performance computing customers, as the company, we provide them C, C++ compilers. We took standard GCC and replaced code generator with our compiler technology to achieve uh, the, the proper result, together with Linux. We have partners which they are taking open source application and they are recompiling and porting and fixing bugs to have set of critical application on the day when the processor hit, reached the market. However, there is lesson to be learned from situation when ARM tried to enter the, the hyperscale space, space. ARM was tried at Google, Amazon, and uh, Google, Amazon, and, and one more vendor. And uh, it took over 12 months and almost $100 million to recompile port more than three to 400 software packages in order to new platform will be deployable, which is very expensive and takes a long time. And for startup, that will be a big problem. So what we are providing, set of high performance application, 30, 40, which they consume typically 70, 80% of cycles natively, but we allow customers to use from day one the application uh, if they have binary for x86 Linux under QMU emulator. So anybody having this technology can mix and match, you know, QMU based the applications with high, high performance application which they are native. So that allows to shorter time from deploy, from having the chips to deployment from 12 months which took for ARM to expect it about two to three months to get critical mass of the application where it's profitable to deploy new architecture. In addition, we have partners in Europe, which they are uh, large uh, service providers who are willing to help our customers on contract service basis to pour the existing application to this platform. So let's talk a little bit about the, the core itself, you know, pretty much standard front end uh, fetching up to eight micro operations per clock. So the execution rate up to eight micro ops, which uh, together can be maximum 16 bytes wide. Machine has one load unit, one load store unit, one store unit. So it can execute three memory operation per clock. This is in line with high performance uh, computing machines like Xeons. Four LUs, three of them are generals, four LUs specialized, and of course the vector unit, which combines floating point, integer, and AI into vector units. And we'll talk about that. On instruction fetch, uh, you know, it provides standard uh, branch target buffer, micro buffer, branch history table, loop predictor, stack predictor, and static predictors. So it's conventional front end. Uh, we did not spend excessively amount of resources on uh, branch prediction. So it's a relatively straightforward, uh, simple branch prediction, which works sufficiently well. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, machine can execute from one to four words per clock, which represent two to eight uh, operations per clock. As operation means operation kind of like risk processor, like load, compare, branch, floating point operation, integer operation, and so on. On the execution front, you know, machine looks mostly like in order execution machine, except it can slide certain instruction to let them execute in the presence of cache misses and consuming dependent inst instruction on the cache misses. So together with compiler, hardware is allowing to not stall on most cache misses. From uh, pipeline is more conventional uh, nine stage pipeline. Thanks 
to not having registry name, uh, you know, scheduling peak and issue instructions. So it's shorter, which helps not only with array and power, it helps with branch misprediction penalties. If you look on memory subsystem, uh, because the machine support 512-bit vectors or matrices, it supports very high bandwidth, uh, 64 bytes per clock or 512-bit per clock from memory subsystem up to two loads and one store to feed the vector engine, which is comparable with, you know, platinum Xeons. Then uh, private L2 cache, which kind of are shared in the pool with other caches, so there is mechanism which plays the local data in local L2 cache, but cooperatively can use other caches, uh, allows to do spill and fill between caches at 64 bytes per clock. So up to 128 bytes per clock can be exchanged between data cache and uh, L2 cache. And, uh, you know, in mesh architecture, the distributed what we call L3 cache, which is pool of other caches, uh, allows to do up to 64 bytes per clock at full clock speed over 4 gigahertz. So it provides sufficient bandwidth to feed the, feed the beast. Let's talk a little bit about the vector unit and, uh, and AI uh, support. It has standard 512-bit vector operation, but it also supports 16-bit uh, floating point, 8-bit uh, data types, and supports uh, vector matrix operation or matrix matrix operation. So in addition to 4x4 four four matrices, uh, it supports up to 8x8 eight 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 matrices, which um, allows to amortize a lot of instructions, fetch, energy, power, and read power against a lot of floating point operation. So in fact, uh, instruction pair or 64-bit or instruction can describe 1,000 floating point operation by one instruction. So that provides very huge performance, but power efficiency and die efficiency. Uh, rest of the chip looks like uh, standard mesh, uh, 8 by 8 mesh, uh, with fully coherent directory-based uh, uh, coherency solution. So it can run any existing either strictly order or weekly order software without porting. However, it has also I/O ring. And the reason for I/O ring is that uh, if it's used in uh, networking applications, high-performance networking applications like tra transcoding between, you know, websites and things what is showing on the phones, it's very important that there are no packet loss or packet drops. So special I/O ring provides predictive, predictable bandwidth to the DRAM and back, which allows to have predictable uh, bandwidth to avoid the packet loss. The mesh is organized as multiple meshes for simplicity and speed and can do about one hop per clock. In addition, there are HBM memory controllers in, in addition to DDR4 and 5 controllers. Now, let's talk about uh, what is the impact, why it's so interesting. What we are trying to show, we show from Amazon, utilization of EC2 cloud over 24 hours and seven days per week. What we can see, that average utilization is under 30%. If you look on the Facebook, we can see 40% utilization within 24 hour cycles because the data center cannot be really balanced across the continents because of the bandwidth cost. So what is interesting, we have the servers which are on average, within 24 hours, 60 to 70 percent idle, and then we have AI chips, which you know they, uh, you can run inference through the day and training during the night. Dedicated NVIDIA hardware. Now, the fact that we are unifying this platform allows these 60 to 70 percent idle servers to run AI or HPC workload when they are idle. So, without spending capital expenditure, without buying dedicated chips our customers will have access to 20 times more AI effectively for free uh, other than paying the electricity with sunken cost. That's completely changing dynamics and cost and amount of AI available to the customers. Uh, why is that very interesting? Let's start on the bottom. If you look uh, on like 100 megawatt Facebook data center, they have about 440,000 servers. And what is interesting, more than 12 hours per day, more than 250,000 servers are idle. 
They are not used. They don't have workload. The system is built for peak performance. Now, if you look on the top side, <coughs> for example, there is a 20 petaflop system in Lawrence Livermore uh, system procured by NNSA, which is simulating full capacity human brain. Unfortunately, at 20 petaflops is about 1,500 times slower than the real time. Uh, also, what we can see here is the Spinnaker system, which again, uh, US government bought one system, another is installed in the University of Manchester, and it has half million processor cores, and it simulates the uh, red brain in the real time. To transition from that system to simulate human brain in real time, it requires about a thousand times more performance, uh, which is about 30 tensor exaflops, or, or half precision exaflops. So what is very interesting that uh, having 250,000 idle servers corresponds to about 30 exaflops performance of half precision, which is sufficient to run the simulation of the full capacity brain in the real time. Originally, it was expected that it will be uh, in 2008 or 9 system available because it will cost one and a half billion dollars. But allowing the system built for hyperscale where this money is spent to be repurposed during idle cycles for AI or this kind of simulation will allow to have much system much earlier and multiple systems, not just few governments having that, but for commercial applications, you know, many hyperscale customers over time will be able to offer that capability. And uh, it's very important because today we have in the world more than $100 billion in start servers and out of that, about $70 billion is underutilized, unused. So having universal platform will allow to free all that resources for AI and other application, and that's the amount of money which cannot be profitably invested. So this is the solution which will accelerate the AI deployment and application. The last interesting point is that uh, hyperscale data centers uh, basically everybody likes to use, but they consume about 2% of total electricity, and they are growing about 15% per year, which mathematically means they are doubling every five years, which mathematically means that we'll be consuming by 20, 30, about 10% of planet energy, and if nothing changes and growth continues, it will have to consume unreasonable or unmanageable amount of 40% of the energy. So the low power is really essential if you want to continue growing the compute capability for the humanity. The, you know, uh, the growth at 15%, uh, it's still doable, but 10 years from now will not be sustainable without changing the power equation. So to summarize, uh, we built universal processors so people can run many different disciplines of AI, a, uh, high performance computing and general server applications. Uh, we did a uh, comparison of uh, 3.5 gigahertz Xeon with GCC 7.2 versus GCC 7.2 compilers, and we, we exceed about by 15% the spec in spec FP. Uh, currently, our compiler still did not have enabled vectorization. Uh, so we did not publish the numbers because vectorization was not enabled, and we expect the vectorization uh, numbers to be available by early next year. Before end of this year, to our customer, we are planning to provide the, the system uh, binary emulation, which allows to run and compile the application and measure performance on standard x86 platform. So before chip will be available, you know, there is 12 months where the, our customer can prepare applications to be deployed. Uh, we are in physical design. Uh, we, we got the, the data path uh, uh, through the physical design. Uh, floating point is the next. Uh, and uh, it's showing that we are limited by the speed of the SRAM, which is about 4 gigahertz at 7 nanometer process at 0.8 volt. So, you know, machine could be faster. Unfortunately, the limit are SRAM. We expect tape out next year and be in volume production uh, shortly after that. So that's our story, and we are sticking to it. And uh, let's move to the questions.
questions for Rado? Hi, Nathan Brookwood again. Uh, in the immortal words of Yogi Berra, I feel like I'm having deja vu all over again. At Hot Chips 10, Intel came to us and talked about a 64-bit design based on a VLIW concept that pushed all the complexity for out-of-order execution onto the compiler. And I see very <laughs> traces of that uh, in your slides as well. So I'm not suggesting that you're falling into the same traps as Itanium, but I'm wondering what you're doing to avoid that. And secondarily, there's a ton of intellectual property uh, by Intel and Intergraph, specifically about VLIW designs. And how are you, as a startup who doesn't have a patent portfolio to trade, going to avoid all of those pitfalls? Excellent question. Thank you for very good questions. So let's look at Itanium. Itanium was VLIW in order execution machine. Concept was, let's build simple hardware and hope that somebody can build a compiler, which never reached the target performance needs and so on. So we, we went the opposite direction. First, we have to achieve performance, so we have to achieve performance comparable to out-of-order execution machine. Therefore, we have to have dynamic, some sort of dynamic scheduling with minimalistic hardware. That's the first difference than the Itanium. Second, we are not VLIW machine. We are graph-based machine where the, every node defies subgraphs where it describes independent or dependent instructions, which VLIW allows to put into bundle only independent instruction. And the last thing was the way how we designed it. We designed the compiler first. And we built hardware around the compiler because that was the hard part. So whatever was hard to do for compiler, we put into hardware. Intel approach was opposite. Let's build the hardware. And because we are Intel, we have hundreds of millions or billion dollars and force the software guys to adapt and never succeeded. So we had to go opposite. We had to build things which killed the Itanium first. And that we built. And we built hardware around that. So we kind of reversed the process. OK. And you also just follow up on this, one of the things you mentioned was emulation as a way to get a whole lot of x86 applications running on your systems when they're available. What kind of penalty do you think you'll be paying in performance for using the emulation as opposed to having native apps? So uh, there is about 40% performance loss. It's significant because uh, our customer did not want us to invest overly in emulation because it's transitional period. So they expect within 12 months, more than 90% of binaries will be native. It just takes time. So it's the bridge through which we can walk through that. And you know we are using standard QMU. Uh, so we did not inv overly invest it there because it's temporary scaffolding or te temporary solution which allows to go from 12 months deployment to three months deployment cycles. And the last point is that under binary emulation, 4 gigahertz machine, under emulation still outperforms 2.5 to 2.8 gigahertz Xeon, so it's still practically used in emulation. But once you move out of the emulation, your performance almost double. And that's, that's the preferred mode, but it will take time to get there. And finally, how do you dodge all the patents that are going to be in your way in terms of building any kind of high performance computer uh, when you are a startup and don't have any patents to trade in the cross license? So uh, another good question, as I allude to do, we, we are not building VLIW processor. Uh, it's kind of a new beast. The space of software-based out-of-order execution is not very, uh, very currently densely populated with the solution. And many aspects, we have to take uh, solutions to solve the problem which nobody other have. So like any other startup, uh, you know, we are on, not in different position. Our technology is significantly different. But hey, it's America. You can be sued by anybody for any reason. <laughs> I hope you have a good lawyer. 
Well, this is my third company, you know, first was Sanford and everybody told me, well, Sandisk has ton of patents, Toshiba, Micron, Intel, and well, company did well. We managed to survive and enter the space when we have big competitors like Intel, Toshiba, Sandisk and others. And the same thing in Skyra, so we just have to be smart, um, not, uh, you know, very aggravate competitors and, and live. Slide 10, it said that you're cutting the load to use latency by generating the address early. How does that work? If you're, you're getting the address by reading it from the cache, so how can you generate it early? So, basically, uh, there are two approaches. You know, our load latency is for cycle, so for high clock speed design. And you, it can be taken in two ways. Uh, if it's execution and address generation in same stage of the pipeline, then after every load, there will be three clocks of not useful work. Now, if the address generation starts early in the pipeline, then the logical latency can be only one. However, there is downside that in some cases, when uh, somebody is uh, changing the address, create address generation interlocks, which will stall the pipeline. So. Overall, uh, our experience told us that having early address generation is uh, profitable compared to having other generation execution stage. Thank you, Rada.